Hello, this is Dr. Roy Shelburne, and you're watching The Best Practices Show. Hey guys, thanks for joining us on the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're navigating the future of insurance and codes and private practice, you're noticing that things are hard and they're difficult and they're challenging. And today I got one of my good friends, an expert, who is going to share with us where the codes come from and the magic words that get you paid. So you don't want to miss this. This is really good stuff. Stuff that makes your brain hurt, but stuff that makes you practice work. And so do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. Now, a couple show notes. We're shooting this live on Facebook. So as you're watching it, if you have questions while we've got Roy on, that's the perfect time to add them to the feed and I'll dish them right to Roy and we'll get the answer right from the expert himself. Or if you're watching this later on, like a lot of you are, you're watching it late at night or whatever, add questions to the feed continuously and you'll see Roy will get back to you because we truly want you to get the most out of this while you're spending time with us. Um, also, thank you again. I can't even say it enough. Thank you so much for the shares, the likes, all that kind of stuff. We're up over 39,000 followers on Facebook, over 150,000 of you on iTunes. And so I we don't even know how it's working. We're just doing it and we're having fun doing it. We've got a ton of unbelievable experts lined up just in the next couple of weeks. So you don't want to miss that either. Now, my guest today, Dr. Roy Shelburne. Roy, I've known you for a long time. You are the best looking bald guy in all of dentistry, <laughs> best dresser, all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. And um, you have a phenomenal story and you have carved a niche. Now, I know you've been on the show twice before and every single time it's like a mountain of content. I spend so much time writing down all the stuff that you say. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people do know you, but we now have an international audience. We've got dental students watching. If somebody doesn't know who Dr. Roy Shelburne is, just give them a little background on who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, I've been a dentist, graduated from dental school since 1981, set up my practice in my grandfather's hardware store building back home, practiced for 27 years when I found that I was a target of a healthcare fraud investigation, went through the investigation process, was indicted, uh, was charged with racketeering, money laundering, healthcare fraud, and I was tried in 2008, was found guilty, went to prison for 19 months, and in the process of preparation for the trial during the investigation and even afterward, I focused on what I did, the mistakes that I made, and my passion is to make sure that I am the last dental professional that goes to prison for things they didn't know or understand. Mm -hmm. In my particular case, the issue was three and a half million dollars in the amount that was found that I got that I wasn't entitled to. $17,899.57, and even though we were able to show that there was treatment that I provided that I could have billed for, should have billed for, didn't, in excess of that amount, it didn't make any difference. So I've, since being released, have focused on the documentation, documentation billing coding pieces. I want everyone to maximize their legitimate reimbursement and minimize the risk. I don't want anybody else to suffer what I did for things they didn't understand. So that's what I do. Yeah. And your story is just an amazing one. I mean, you're one of those guys, a true hero in dentistry who took something that was very hard, extremely hard, and you made it positive for all of us. And now, you know, um, instead of, you know, it's one of those things you're making our lives better just by your expertise and your willingness to give. And if you've got a study club and you need an expert on this kind of stuff, this is your guy. Like he'll come out. He's a phenomenal speaker. I get a chance to see you at all the major meetings. It's just a wealth of knowledge. And you also spend time in places none of us want to spend. Like this yeah. is hard work keeping up with what's going on in codes. And today we're going to be talking about where the dental codes come from and um, the magic words that get them paid. Now, you know how I like to do this. I always want to talk about the why. Why is this so important before we get into the how? 
Well, a lot of times we hear people complain about, well, why is this code this way? Or why does it not code for this or another? And to me, I always want to know why, like you, why there's not a code, but also to understand the process. And there's a process that involved in coding that hinders its ability to move as fast as dentistry does. Technology is moving so rapidly, there are techniques that are being used, and there's just no code to describe it because it, there's a cycle in the process of establishing codes. And if you understand the cycle, it will give you a better idea of why they are moving so slowly to keep up with the change in dentistry, but it also will give you the tools necessary if you are providing a service and you feel that there's no code to describe that, there is a method for you or anybody as far as that's concerned to be able to submit a code to the code committee and have that code be evaluated and adopted if necessary. Things went back. It was probably in the early thousands, 2000s, when there was an argument basically a fuss between the insurance companies and the American Dental Association, both wanted to control the codes. They wanted to be able to establish them and to limit them or to pigeonhole them in a particular area. So there was a feud between the American Dental Association and the insurance industry mm -hmm. that, that could not be resolved. So it actually was taken to court. There was a trial and there was a court order made that split it down the middle, mm -hmm. that said the codes, the committee will meet yearly and there'll be six representatives from the insurance industry, there'll be six representatives from the dental, American Dental Association, you're gonna come up together once a year and decide what codes you're gonna add, change, or delete. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with that is with six from the insurance industry and six from the dental industry, it was almost always a deadlock. So if there was a, a code that was submitted, the insurance industry would want it, the dental industry would not, it would fail. It had to have a majority vote. Mm -hmm. So for several years, back until 2012, there were almost no code changes per year. There were very few and they were not significant when they did change. The court order ended in 2012. And there was a whole reassessment of the process. It ended up being there are a vast majority more dental representatives than there are insurance representatives now. So since 2012, we've seen about uh, almost 320 code changes in that period, whereas before there's been almost none. Mm -hmm. So lesson number one, if you don't have an updated code book, you're behind because those change, you're using references from, from years ago, and those codes may not be active, and even the ones that are the same, the descriptions may have changed, it, changed somewhat so that they aren't applied in the same way. So you need to be familiar with those codes. That's a, that's a committee that I go to every year. Um, usually happen, it happened, to, happened in February, in years prior to two years ago, it moved to March. It's at the, the committee meetings at the American Dental Association building headquarters in Chicago. And depending on the number of submissions requests, it can take one day, it can take three days. So early on in the process, after the, the log jam was cleared, when the American Dental Association had more representatives than the insurance company, the first year it took two and a half days to get through all the code changes. Wow. Then it's gotten a little bit fewer as years go on. This year there were 80-ish um, codes that were submitted. Anybody can submit a code for evaluation. There is a form at the American Dental Association website. If you go and download that form, there'll be sp specific instructions about how to fill out that application but anyone, in, you don't have to be a dentist, you can be anyone from anywhere can submit a code for evaluation. Some insurance or some um, vendors, some people who provide products have actually submitted codes to have that product that they have introduced be covered with a code. The reason being is 
if you use a non-specified code, they're all in every code category. There's a non-specified code, and it's usually ends in nine nine nine. But if you submit a non-specified code to an insurance carrier, it's very unlikely it'll be considered for payment. They only pay recognized codes for recognized services. So if you're performing a service that you feel it's appropriate to have a code for, you can go to the American Dental Association website, download that. Um, the deadline for that is October 31st. So all the codes that they receive, requests that they receive now till October 31st, those are accumulated, put together, and they are distributed to the committee members you, that committee meets in March. All the submissions are reviewed. They're either accepted, they are declined, or they may send them to committee to be modified or worked on for to be evaluated the next year. For those codes that are accepted in March of this year, they become effective January 1st of next year. So the codes that were submitted in 17 were reviewed in 18, and will become codes in 19. So there's a three-year lip lag between. So therein lies part of the issues. For example, um, the Perio Protect trays. Um, those were developed a few years ago. They had a representative that came to the code maintenance committee, made a request for a code to describe that procedure, went through the process, but it was three years after they presented that request to the, the maintenance committee before it was processed and became a code. Mm -hmm. So therein lies part of the problem. There is a, a lag between the time when the code is necessary until when the code is actually in the code set. Interestingly, <clears throat> there have been some codes that have been introduced almost every year that I've been going and have never been adopted. Um, the use of lasers being one of them. They wanted a code to describe laser therapy. And to kind of get you behind the curtain, the reason why it's been denied, they establish codes based on the service that's being provided. So depending on how you're using that laser, so if that's part of your scaling and root planning procedure, they feel that anything that you use during that procedure to accomplish scaling and root planing is included in that process. They don't care whether you use a scaler, whether you use a laser, or whether you use a butter knife. It's not the tool you use, it is the service that you provide. And there's a little bit of confusion there about well, why don't they recognize the laser service? And it may be, in some instances, an adjunctive service different from, but it all depends on what your ultimate goal is in providing that service, regardless of what you use. So, like I said, anything you use to accomplish an appropriate scaling and root planning, it's scaling and root planning, regardless of what you use to be able to do that. So, it's, it's a good idea to have a code that you'd like to add to work with the specialty that it might involve. For mm -hmm. example, if it's a periodontal issue, you might um, get in touch with the AAP work with them to help submit that code. If it comes from one of the larger um, recognized specialty, that's going to have more weight than if it comes from a general dentist. So like I said, before you do it independently, I, if it's a restorative procedure, you might do um, contact the um, prosthetic uh, specialties, depending on how it's used. And there'll be more weight and they'll help you through the process, understanding the ins and outs of submitting codes to the code maintenance committee. It increases the chances it's going to be improved or approved. So they can, like I said, either adopt it, they can decide not to adopt it, or they can refer it to a committee to determine. And the, an example of that, the 4346 code, the scaling in the presence of moderate to severe generalized inflammation, that was a result of a committee's work to come up with a code that was palatable for everybody. The insurance companies, in addition to, they are hoping that the 
Yeah, I can still hear you. Just you. Okay. There, there you go. Um, so, where was I? I chased a rabbit. Yeah, um, I lost you there in just a second, but you were. Um, I, I want to get into the coat, but as you can see, like this is so heavy on. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's pretty it's, heavy. And it's talking, technical, so a code geek would enjoy it. The rest of the people's kind of, I don't need them. Bottom line is that's the reason why the code, they move more slowly than we need them to. It's right. it's a matter of the way it's set up. So right. um, if, you, if you don't like the way things are, you do have a voice and you're able to submit those yourself. Yeah. And that's All good. Right. That's the piece to know. And this is good. This is an awesome background on where codes come from. Before we get into the words that get them paid, tell us, you know, you and I talked to us about a little bit last time, yeah. where codes are headed, you know, because there's a consensus that yeah. dental codes are going to go away. It's going to become all medical codes. How true is that? And what time frame? And what are the complicated, like, is that real? Do you believe that? I, I believe that with all my heart. Um, insurance companies don't like to maintain two separate departments, their dental department and their medical department. I always go back to the money. They uh, they also want claims so that they're auto adjudicated, which means when you submit the claim, they want it to be processed without a human being having to look at it and review it. So a lot of the codes and code changes that they have established make it so it's easier for them to process. Mm -hmm. For example, they cleaned the um, partial codes and the denture codes, so they specify upper and lower. A lot of the codes did not do that before, so they always had to come back or somebody had to review it and say, okay, they had to enter it as an upper denture or a lower denture. If they didn't have the information in there, they would have to contact the, the office for that information. They've continued to hone those codes so that they're very specific, so the upper and lower um, codes help to process it so it's in the code. Somebody doesn't have to look and say, well, is that an upper or lower one when they process and get that in the system? So that's that's moving in that direction. Additionally, I got that roaring light. Was again, sorry. Um, yeah, is it going? Is that, a, <laughs> that might be over my house. I don't know. Here, let me try this. Roy, just, no, it's, it's better now. Is it better now? Okay, hold it on. It is better now. All right. So, movement from dental and medical, there have been a lot of changes in the medical coding just to expand it so that it is more easily used by dental practices. It's going to be tougher, but I, I, I'm a firm believer that in the next seven to ten years, the dental codes will be a thing of the past, that it will only be medical, and they'll have one department. It'll be a medical claims processing, and that we all um, that we all submit medical. And like I said, is that going to increase the complications? It absolutely is. It's going to mean that you're going to have to have a whole lot more training and you're going to have to have a, a great deal of expertise. So if someone wants to look to the future and say, okay, I want to be viable in the dental world, get your certification in medical billing and coding. You'll find a place and be very um, sought after in terms of, a, of an employee of a dental practice. Absolutely. It's kind of a non-negotiable of the future. And when you think about it, it's kind of scary that they're not going to have people answering these phones anymore. No. So now I love how health care is just determined by, you know, computers now and not so much people. So we won't even go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. But but, you know, knowing the ins and outs of coding. Uh, is critically important because you can get reimbursed your full fee if you know how to use the medical codes Absolutely. for a lot of procedures. So don't look at it as, wow, you're just building more of an insurance-based practice. No, no, no. You're becoming more knowledgeable so you know how to navigate that. No, so, it's an opportunity. If it's billable to the medical, medical usually bills or is at a much higher rate. There are right. fewer restrictions. So like I said, it, it's not an aggravation to learn to build to medical. It's it's an opportunity really for practices to grow and become more of the healthcare world. We're not going to be our own separate entity in dentistry and all the other health professionals work together. We're going to be part of that community. And, and in order to do that, there again, our documentation in the practice needs to be able to 
be communicated easily to the physicians, but also the past billing and coding, the diagnosis codes, which may help get that service paid if it's related to a medical condition. Yeah. Now you're going to give us some of the magic words to get them paid, but but yeah. give us the thinking before that, because so you're not just going to give us a simple phrase and it. But tell us a little bit about why these words work or where we're going with this. Well, you know, we were talking about talking to a live person. If you've noticed when you call for verification of insurance benefits now, it's not necessarily a person that teach, speaks English very well. So for the insurance companies to save money, they farm that off overseas. And the people who are reviewing and processing those claims do not know English very well. They don't know, or if they know anything, it's very little about dentistry. So you have a person there who is processing the claim who knows very little about dentistry. And in order for them to do that, they literally have a list of magic words that if it is included in the narrative or supportive information about the service that you're submitting the, the claim for, they check that box. Yes, the magic words here will go ahead and pay that. So there's, like I said, it, as scary as that may seem, you not only have to be aware of what code describes that service, but there's a team member and the doctor needs to include that in the clinical record. So that magic word is contained in that document that will help that billing person identify that this is why that service was necessary. And when they do, box checked, click approved, and the check is issued. That is so interesting, buddy. I totally forgot. I've got the air show going on and there's jets flying over my oh, house. <laughs> so I'm going to strategically mute. Um, and of course they have to fly over when I'm talking to you. So, uh, the, uh, so, so walk us through this, you know, um, w when we're on the phone, what's the, what are some of the steps that are included to make sure we get paid for this? Well, um, you go from payment backward to find out what Number one, most of the codes will be very specific. So you are identifying that specific word or phrase in that service that you're providing. For example, the codes are becoming very much more specific. So we've talked about the 4346, the scaling in the presence of moderate to severe generalized inflammation. So the clinical record should, that diagnosis should state moderate, generalized inflammation. And that would justify the billing of that code. Um, that one is not so auto adjudicated now because it's new. And I think we may have talked a little bit more, but it probably bears uh, repeating. Even when the code is accepted, after that three year period going through the process, it may take another year or year and a half for it to be paid by an insurance carrier because they've sold a plan to either the person or the employer and it has a list of covered services. New code is not on that list. So it may very well not be covered during that period until they have a chance to modernize or improve the coverage mix. And when it does, then it may be paid. So just because you have a new code, there's no guarantee that it's going to be paid. If that knowledge is not part of that person who is submitting the claims, if you are unaware of what actually justifies the payment for, specifically, let's talk about cracked teeth. A lot of dentists and teams have a hard time having a cracked tooth be approved with many of the plans. The reason for that, most plans considered a crack normal. A lot of teeth are cracked. The issue that will justify the crown to be able to be reimbursed by that, there has to be pain associated with. So you're either going to have to have pain on release, pain on biting, or hot and cold sensitivity as a result of the crack. A lot of times, care or the, the person who is submitting the claim will there'd be a great photo there. There's this big honk and crack in the tooth. And you'd think, well, anybody could see this and it looks like it's going to break. So why in the world did they deny this? Plans from their point of view consider cracked teeth normal. A lot of teeth will crack over time unless there is a mitigating circumstance, for example, pain associated with, they don't consider it medically necessary. 
So there again, you may think, okay, this picture shows, obviously there's a huge crack, but unless you disclose to the insurance carrier that there is pain, they probably will not pay it. So the magic word for a cracked tooth is pain or discomfort of some kind and how the patient is um, experiencing it. It's also right. going to be hit to have pictures as well, but that's, that's a case where there's a magic word as well. One thing I, I do want to ask you is give us some perspective. We joke in dentistry, it's the pre-denial. We fill out a pre-denial. How many claims get denied? Just give us some perspective on that as best you know. It, it depends on the service. Um, insurance companies have, have focused on particular areas that they feel that there's abuse. Um, and there may be some issues. They either may reduce the reimbursement for that particular service, or it may be that they ask for additional information or will write different clauses in that plan that will reduce the reimbursement for. Periodontal treatment is huge bugaboo. They, um, they feel like it's being um, submitted, scaling and replaying specifically, more commonly than necessary. So as far as the magic words that would justify reimbursement for scaling and root planing, one of three things has to happen. Bleeding on probing because bleeding tissue is not healthy. Number two, there needs to be pocketing four millimeters or greater. And the kicker usually, if it's, if it's booted out, it's the bone loss. And most carriers say there needs to be a 10% of the bone loss for it to justify scaling and root planing. So you may have a patient who comes in and everything looks horrible. The tissues are swollen, but those are pseudo pockets. If the bone loss is not evident, then that is that will not justify the reimbursement for the scaling and root planing. So when reviewing that, you need to make sure when the doctor reviews the radiographs that there is significant bone loss there to justify that scaling and root planing. And like I said, they're pushing back uh, because they feel like that is submitted more frequently than necessary and actually, the reason the new 4346 code was introduced, it gave offices that alternative that gives them um, a, a code that they can use that describes the, the work, a higher level of, of uh, work that you need to do for that patient who presents with inflammation that, and pseudopockets and bleeding and, and unhealthy tissues. Very interesting. Now... What are so take us through the walk walk us through the magic words piece of it though. Right. Obviously this is gonna change over time. They're gonna change yeah. the magic words, but what are the magic words for now? Well, um, for example, if what raising a reimbursement for a, an extraction from being a basic simple extraction to a surgical extraction, two magic words there, you have to use one or two of one of the two, or you can use both the two. Number one, sectioning. The tooth had to be cut to be able to get out. Or the other thing, bone removal. So you have to, at some point, remove the bone to be able to get the tooth out. In years past, and this is one of the cases where the, the code has changed a little bit, it, it indicated flap and sutures. That's no longer a part of it. That's included should it be a part of the surgical extraction. But if you have to... Um, lay a flap or suture the area and you don't section the tooth and you don't remove bone, that is not surgical. So there are a lot of confusion there. The magic words are sectioning or bone removal. Love it. Love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. What else are you seeing out there as far as magic words for other procedures? Well, um, you have to be aware that when treating the mouth in general, you have to establish medical necessity. So that relates, for example, to radiographs. Um, being due, the magic word for being due is medically justified, not what the insurance is going to pay for. So when putting together your treatment plan and what you're going to do as a preventive procedure or to take radiographs for a patient. You need to think about, is this something that I need as a provider to meet standard of care? 
So the magic word is justified. It has to be justified medically. The FDA and the ADA put together a document uh, in 2008, updated in 2012, that is a great supportive document. It actually outlines what would be considered medically necessary. It actually puts, it has a grid available that um, some risk factors at the top, age of the patient on the other, and it's going to give you a box of what is generally considered standard of care. That's not a be all and end all, but it gives you a good idea of what the standard would be for a person with a risk of, of whatever that level might be and an age of a certain other level. Um, as far as the scaling and replaning piece, the standard of care for a patient with a periodontal issue would be a full mouth series. So if you are submitting a Panorex and a set of bite wings to justify scaling and root planning and you're getting denied because the whoever reviewed it said it doesn't look like it's necessary, you can't get a good idea of bone levels and be consistently correct without a full mouth series. So there again, the magic word, which is more than one magic word with a scaling and root planning is full mouth series to support it. So if you're, if you're sending just to Panorex and Bite Wings in, there's a good chance that they will disallow it because they can't, the person who reviews it, the dentist who reviews it, can't see what the uh, normal person providing care, standard of care, would see in a full mouth series. Yeah, and I could already see the complications in this. A lot of times, these are going to be clinical things that are talked about, and then somebody administratively is going to be filling this out who has no idea and that's why as a dentist, it's critically important. You got to do a clinical calibration with your team members so they know how to communicate, correct? Absolutely. To document, uh, to communicate, and to support that service that you are providing for the patient. It's a whole team effort. Everybody's involved. You have, to be honest with you, everybody needs to understand um, the requirements as far as the documentation piece to be able to give that person who is in the business area in submitting that claim the support they need to be able to get consistent reimbursement for. And there's a there's actually a, a kind of a danger there as well. Make sure that that is documented because in some instances, the business person does not have the necessary information to justify, for, for example, that crown. So they may go to the chair side assistant may go to the doctor and say, hey, um, you diagnosed a crown for this patient. And I, I can't see from your clinical record what justified, why, why it was necessary. Can you tell me? And the doctor may go ahead and then dictate what the observation was. Well, there was a mesiobuccal fracture. Of the cusp was missing. Two thirds of the crown was, or two thirds of the tooth was a filling, recurrent decay. There wasn't enough tooth structure once we get all that cleaned out to support of filling, so the crown's necessary to restore contour and function. So the business person would be writing furiously to get all this information down, goes to the computer, enters all the information, fires that off to the insurance. That business person, if they're well-educated, know that they need to put that in the clinical record because otherwise it doesn't get in there. And heaven forbid a practice is audited in this particular instance, the scenario that I talked about was one of the one of the claims that is being audited. The insurance in person has the claim in one hand and they read that and it's perfectly justified the crown that's being provided. And then they review the clinical record and there's nothing in there that reflects what was in that clinical the claim. There's a good chance that they'll ask for the money back for that service because it's not justified by the clinical record. So Magic word there is documentation. Right. Yeah. And I see so, so many times, you know, in these courses that are so great, you provide them, you can just see the team members been sent to do this and the doctor's not present or, yeah. you know, it is a team effort. Everybody's got to know how this works. It is. Um, and and the, the part you made about calibration, it is vital. Everybody understands how the system works and who takes part and does which piece of that. It's not just the clinical people. It's not just the business people. It's not the, the doctor. Everybody has to work together understanding what's necessary to make sure that you capture all the information, provide it appropriately, and get reimbursed for. 
Right. You know, as in a dentist, you might be watching this, you thinking, gosh, Kirk, that's too hard. I got so many other things going on. One of the things that we teach and our coaches teach is they teach clinical calibration just for technical reasons for the team. It's a great opportunity to introduce the code reasons too. You're you're already in the conversation. Absolutely. Now now create three by five cards and they'll just create simple little three by five cards. Why does the doctor do this procedure? Why is this important? You can just flip it over and say, okay, here's the coding um, important things that you need to know. So the whole idea is to create a system and Roy, this is just fabulous. What, what else do we need to know about magic words? I didn't know it was, <laughs> I, I had no idea that the call center is looking for keywords. Like yeah, that, yeah. that's kind of. No, it's, it's it, in, in, anything that you're looking at. Um, they are going to have the criterion. If you, I encourage you, if you have something denied, go to the website and look for the magic word. Most of the insurance carriers, if you go in, you poke around, it will give you justification what the criterion is to justify that service. For example, crowns, for example, scaling and root planing, they'll tell you what their own magic words are. Different insurance companies are different too in terms of what they're looking for. So be aware that some of the basics, some of them are uh, universal, but some some plans will have exactly what you need to include in that claim to justify it. And, you know, as far as magic words on denials, you need to, anytime you get the denial from the insurance company, I, I go to their meetings where the, the dentists who actually work for the insurance companies, they're the ones who review claims. And the one thing that hacks them all off more than anything else is to cite the doctor's credentials. They could care less their education level or how many specialties or how far they've gone beyond the basic to be able to do that. They don't care. They don't, well, to be honest with you, they don't get paid enough to care. They, they want the bottom line. It's kind of like, I'm smarter than you are. I'm better than you are. So go ahead and approve my claim. And they're on the other side going, just give me the information I need and I will approve your claim. This is not the information I needed. So magic words, anytime you get a denial, review the EOB completely. It will more than likely establish the reason for the denial. And I would, if that insurance company does not provide good and clear information on the website about why they deny, I would get a denial. I would talk to the person who denied it. You can call them and say, hey, we got this denial back. Could you be more specific? And put together that information in your information about that carrier so you can see from that point going forward well this is a carrier that that required this be part of it or this magic word be a part of it they'll tell you the eob will generally tell you um and if you dig deep deep enough they'll disclose to you what you need to to add to or include going forward in the future to make sure your claims get processed yeah. It's, now, yeah. Now, yeah. I always have this question: When you do the EOB, let's say you review it, they tell you you can do some investigative work on why this happened. How much do you teach people to resubmit? Like, because a lot of times dentists just give up, or team members. Now, tell us a little bit about the psychology of that process. Yeah. I always, always, always resubmit. If you feel like it was denied inappropriately. To be honest with you, my experience has been some insurance companies will deny just to see what you're going to do with it. It's kind of like, okay, this one's, this one's on the fence. Let's go ahead and deny this one and see how married they are to this treatment. And if you, if you stand your ground, have a good basis for why you're doing it, always appeal. The reason being is that if the per first person reviewed the claim and denied it, it's always reviewed by a second professional when it was resubmitted to be reevaluated. And we all know if we gave the same treatment plan or the same records for one patient to five different dentists, how many different treatment plans would be generated? Different ones. Uh, as many dentists as you submitted it to. Oh, or right? more than, probably two or three of them couldn't figure out one treatment plan, so they generate two or three. Right. So we live in a world that's very different in that you can get varying opinions almost any time by different professionals. Some people would look at it and go, yeah, I'd do a crown on that. Somebody else would do a 
five surface amalgam. Somebody else would not do anything to it at all. So that person who's reviewed it, it's human. It's a dentist who has reviewed it and they may not have the same philosophy you do, but when you resubmit it, the other person who reviewed it, different person will look at it and go, yeah, I think that's pretty well justified. So always, always, always appeal. Yeah. Anything else that you would say would be a good tip on appealing? Anything other tips? Yeah. Like I said, review the EOB and I would, if it's not on the website, I would, I would call and say, Hey, can you give me the criterion you use to justify the need for X? One of the things that was really surprising me to me when I was at one of these meetings is, um, they send the same case, the same claims to four different claims processor and they bring them in as a panel and they go through what they would have done with this particular claim. And it's, they're all over the board that way too, which goes back to always resubmit it because they're for the people on the panel. One of them would have paid it. The other one would ask for additional information. One would have not paid it. So it's all over the board, but there was one that they were all unanimous, unanimous with, which kind of surprised me. It was an anterior tooth looked like it may have been traumatized and it was, um, it's earlier, it caused it to abscess. So there was a very conservative uh, endodontic procedure done, just small access opening, cleaned up, finished the endodontic procedure. And back in the day when I went to dental school, if the tooth had had an endodontic procedure, that was criterion for a crown to be able to cover and seal and protect. Shocked me, all four of these people who did the review with this conservative endodontic procedure on an anterior tooth, all of them said they would not have covered the crown. So there again, be familiar with, and I, I, I don't know if that's something new in dentistry, but- Can you give me a little perspective on why? Or just what's your hypothesis on that? On that, they, they stated there was enough tooth structure there, sound enough tooth structure there that it would be stable without having to have the crown done on it. So it's kind of like, okay, I learned something there. But there I again, if, if you don't know the criterion, like I said, old school, when I went back and graduated in 81, if it was an endodontic treated tooth, the, the, the suggestion was that it would be covered with a crown. Right. Wow. Yeah. Gosh. Any other, you know, I know we only get you for so long here today, yeah. but any other things that you would share with us as we kind of wrap this up on the magic words yeah. or things that we need to know um, when it comes to reimbursement? Well, especially um, the magic word with reimbursement, if you're in network, knowledge. Knowledge is power. You have to understand the limitations that are established on that plan. I get the unfortunate opportunity to speak to a lot of people who in, have submitted a claim and it, it, should it have been paid? Yes, was it medically justified? Yes, but the limitations on the plan made it so that it would not be reimbursable. And they asked me, well, is there any way to get around that? If the plan limits the reimbursement for that particular procedure, not only can you not get around it, it would be fraudulent for that insurance carrier to pay something that was not covered on that plan. So there, I get a lot of questions like, can we, can we not do this or this, or is there something else we can do? And if the contract says, no, it will not be paid, it will not be paid whether or not it's medically justified. So understand, understand what that contract says and that you are bound by your signature on the contract to adhere to every component. Think long and hard before you sign that contract. I'm never going to tell you not to sign it, but for your practice, you have to understand whether it's going to be beneficial to your practice or whether it's going to be detrimental to your practice. You know, I, I talked to a doctor just two days ago, had done this amazing reconstruction with implants and with a prosthesis. The patient was happy. The result was beautiful. They submitted it to the insurance, and the lab fee for this procedure was $7,500, $7,500, and the insurance allowance was $2,500. That, wow. is, that is a bad day. That is a very bad day. And you can send yourself into a spiral as a dentist and get really angry 
in a way that it's not even logical. So you got to protect yourself too, because you and I can sit here and if you're a dentist watching this, you could easily just go into a rage right now and get oh. even more mad about insurance. And you can't do that. It's, no. they don't, they, it, this has nothing to do with healthcare. It has nothing, you know, dent, you know, insurance companies aren't just going to say, Roy, we joke about this all the time. They're not going to go, you know what? We've been kind of rough on dentists for the last, let, let's, let's reimburse them all. What do you guys think? Are we good with that? No, yeah. it's going to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And people are going to be playing with charts and all that kind of stuff. And the only thing you can do as a dentist is just say, that's, that's the game. And yeah. you're exactly right. Before I sign this piece of paper, number one, when you sign the piece of paper, keep a copy of it. That's yeah. amazing. I mean, 99% of dentists, you sign it. Yeah. 99% <laughs> of dentists. I'm like, send it to me. They're like, send you what? I'm like, you sign something. And they go, are you sure? Yes. I'm like, yes. And yeah. then when they, like you shared with us last time, they change the rules and it's this thick. It comes in the, with yeah. 30 days notice yeah. and you don't even read it as a dentist. You throw it in the trash. Right. And, and then you look at your numbers at the end of the next quarter and you're like, what is that, going on? How did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. So don't go there. I guess we're no. just trying to. Yeah. And what I am going to say is if you're watching this, you already know how smart this guy is because this stuff hurts my brain. Get yourself there. Get your team there. If you can't get there, get Roy to you. Now, Roy, do you go into offices? Do I, you still? Absolutely. I do. Okay. Yeah, I still do. Yeah. So what do you do that, when actually. you go into that? What do you? Uh, I do an analysis of both the documentation and the billing and coding. And most of the time, I, I find areas where they are leaving a significant amount of money on the table. There are things that they could have billed for that they didn't. It's just a matter of understanding what's billable and what's not billable. And, you know, if they need an analysis to find out whether or not it is worthwhile for them to stay in that, that, um, that program, absolutely. And there are... Even if you're in network, there are optional services that you need to be aware of and um, methods to be able to provide the care the patient needs and wants and not being limited by the insurance carrier by understanding the ins and outs to make sure that that works. Is there a way to maximize your benefit legitimately? Absolutely. And I, I love being able to do that. Yeah. So don't even hesitate. If you're struggling with this, get Roy in your office, at least schedule a call. And Roy, tell us, I know there's going to be people that are going to be watching this. They're going to want to reach out to you and see what you do. He goes to all the major meetings. He's at all of them, all the big ones. Go see him speak and bring your team at the very least. Now, Roy, if somebody's watching this and they want more information, keep in mind, there are going to be some people listening to iTunes. How can I find out more about you? Sure. Uh, give me an email. Fire it off. It's uh, my name, R O Y. S H E L B U R N E at gmail.com. Awesome, buddy. Yeah. Cool. Well, you and I have a ton more topics we're going to cover on future uh -huh. shows. Yeah. And uh, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But if we'll you. Do. Yeah. If you enjoyed today, just do us a favor. Just hit the share button, share this with your friends. Um, we would love it. Also, if you want to see specific topics with Roy, specific questions, add them to the feed and Roy and I will just schedule them out and we'll make it happen. And you'll Happy. see, we'll bring you tons and tons of information. Other things that you guys want to see, keep sending them to us. Um, and if you're struggling, just reach out and get Roy to come to your office. So thank you again, my friend. And, um, Thank you, guys. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.